If you never heard or anything about it, you know, it's a, it's a pretty in-depth teaching. So we're going to, um, it's not going to be a short lesson, right? So the main thing we do in atonement, I want to understand the word, right? So to atone is to make amends, to provide or serve as reparation or compensation for something bad or unwelcome. Um, atonement can be reparation for an offense or injury. Okay, so we're dealing with the Day of Atonement. This is what it's dealing with, to make amends, um, a, a sense of reparation, you know, a compensation for something that's bad. We're going to see that's really dealing with our sins, okay? So we're dealing with the atonement is the day um, that we're, we're basically reparation for sins, we're paying for the sins, okay? So the big question is, why do we need to observe it today? All right, uh, can I go to First John 3 and 4? We hear this all the time, probably every week. Uh, all right, so our John 3 and 4, read that for us. Whosoever committed sin transgressive also the law, but sin is the transgression of the law. All right. So when you transgress the law, you are in sin, all right? So whosoever committed sin transgresseth of the law, for sin is the transgression of law, all right? Let me get uh, I, John, go to, uh, go to the first chapter now, same book, and start at verse 8, all right? So now we know what sin is. When you break the law, now you are being classified, um, it's getting identified as a sin, all right? So I, John chapter one and verse eight. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Mm -hmm. So we see that if we say that we have no sin, we only deceive in ourselves, beloved, because what? We have all sinned, okay? Read verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and, for, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we know sin is a transgression of the law. And now we know that what? We all transgress the law. Some way or another, we transgress the law. We broke the law. Okay. And it says, if we confess, and this is what we today that big focus on is us confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And not just to forgive us, but what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the big thing about today being cleaned from the things we have done wrong. Not to try to justify, not to try to minimize the sin and everything. No, throw it out there. You're done wrong. We went against God one way or another. Okay? Everybody has. Mm -hmm. That's why this is important. Yep. Don't deceive yourselves. Some people are deceived thinking they never sin. Trying to justify certain things. You sin. Okay? But God has made a plan for us. All right? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Why we need to observe this day is because you sinned, all right? And this day is special for all sinners, all right? All sinners, this day is special for us. So Leviticus chapter 23 and start at verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So we see what? 
The most high is putting this thing together. He's mm-hmm. telling you what you do. Yeah. This ain't, oh, this is the Jews' feast. This is the, the lines of Zion. We decided to do this. This is nothing to do with us. Bigger than us. The origin come from righteousness. It's divine. All right? Give us verse four. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So these are feasts of the Lord and what? Holy convocations. Yeah. See, holy people, we understand that we have messed up. We understand that we sin. Okay? But us that are trying to what? Do right. If this is a gathering of people that are trying to do right, it's a holy convocation. That's right. Everybody not on, everybody, and I'm not on shots to nobody, but the whole world don't know about these things. It's not for the whole world to be gathering these things. It's a holy convocation. People that are holy supposed to be convocating in these times. Okay? And it says, you should proclaim it in their season. We do it how the Most High told us to do it. Okay? That's why we're here today. If you didn't know. All right? Let's jump down to verse 26, right? Because you can read it, go through the other feasts that we kind of go through, but we're going to focus on today. All right? Let's go to verse 26, because you got to do it in the season. Okay? Verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer a, a, a new so lucky, and offer a offering made by fire unto the Lord. So the tenth day of the seventh month, okay? Of course, we can't go with man's calendar. So we not we don't go with that. But when we calculated this is the uh tenth day of the seventh month. All right. There should be a day of atonement. So this is going to be that day of atonement, the holy convocation, and we're going to afflict our souls. This is why we fast, the form of afflicting our souls. Um, the offering made by fire, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, you don't have to do that part, mm -hmm. okay? Because this is the whole thing about the dispensation. But during this dispensation, this first covenant, you would have to offer it by fire, okay? You would have to, okay? But we're not in that dispensation, so we don't have to worry about that. All right, verse 8. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. So um, this is the day you try to take off. When I try, you do it. You know, you get to work it, you know. Um, you, you get a lot of days to take off. You schedule this, okay? So you schedule this day to take off so you don't have to work, okay? Because what? It is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. This day is set aside. So the only thing you have to worry about is atoning for yourself. All right. Verse 29. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. If you don't want to be afflicted this day, it says what? You'd be cut off. Mm -hmm. Ain't compromising with you. He ain't making deals with you. You gonna do what does say of the Lord, or you not? We gotta be mindful. People that always want to question, well, what about this technique? Listen, you don't want to afflict your soul today, then be cut off. That's right. You don't want to keep set, then be cut off. You mm -hmm. don't. Want, everything's always then be cut off. That's how the Most High does it, because He's our Father. He ain't a friend of ours on that level. Well, if I want to listen, I'll listen. Uh-uh. He's the God of the universe. You make room for him. Mm -hmm. You make room for everything else. But we can't make room for him. And we claim that he gave us everything. So they'll be cut off. Let's go. Verse 30. And whatsoever soul would be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. He said he's going to do it, <laughs> didn't he? Mm -hmm, destroy. I'm always, he said, I'm going to destroy him from among his people if you do any work that day. All right? right? 
Because this is very important, beloved. That's why I say, when we understand it, it, it's a reason why he's going to this extreme or may see extreme. But if you really understand the concept, you're destroying yourself. If you really understand what's happening. All right. Verse 31. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. All right. So wherever you dwell, it should be the same statue, right? Whether you in the land, whether you out the land. Verse 32. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even unto even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. All right, so we ain't going to go into a whole war. Listen, beloved, the Day of Atonement, this should be very simple. The Day of Atonement is on the 10th day. It's a Day of Atonement. So you're going to afflict yourself on this day. Mm -hmm. So he's saying ninth day at even to the 10th day at even, you're going to afflict, um, I'm going to make sure I get it right, the ninth day of the month at even, from even, and even until even, you should celebrate your Sabbath. So this we're going to refer to as a Sabbath. So you understand it. The ninth day at even. For people that have ninth day, even, even meaning just at the beginning of a day, you're going to miss the day. If you start off the ninth day in the beginning and then the tenth day at even means the beginning of the day, guess what? You're going to be fasting the day before the day of atonement. Don't make sense. So we have to understand that even can be the beginning of the day and also can be the going out of a day. Yep. If you don't have that understanding, I'm guaranteeing anybody that just say it's one way, you don't understand the book. I'm going to argue with you. You just don't understand it. And you're going to miss this whole thing. Mm -hmm. This day at even mean the ninth day going out, like we're doing, like we're going out, right? The ninth day is going out. And what? That will be so you can get the beginning of the 10th day. And then when the 10th day is going out, now that will end the 10th day. You see how you get that, that, that day, that day period? So you're fasting from the beginning. You ain't doing a 12 hour fast. You're getting from the beginning, um, the ending of one day, and then the ending of the day of the 10th. Okay. So you're getting that full thing. All right. So let me see if I have any other notes. So these are just little notes, just in case you missed it. You celebrate it forever, um, 24 hours from sundown to sundown, just for layman's term. All right. Even to even. So the ninth day, sundown to the 10th day at sundown. This will be the whole day of atonement. Our days, 24 hours. You will have some, and I'm just going to make the point, you have some passages where a day is 12 hours. You got to look at the context, beloved. Okay? All right. Hopefully we're all good. We're all good. Let's go to Leviticus 16. All right, let's get into this day of atonement. I want you to understand the, the history of it because if you don't understand the history, you're not going to be able to appreciate where God has us now, you're not. Right? You have to understand the beginning part. It's beautiful how the Most High had this thing put together. All right, Leviticus 16. And what I have on here is so you can see how, you know, um, I'm just showing you kind of a replica, uh, replication of how it will look in the Old Testament, okay? So they will have it. This will be in the midst of them. Um, before we got our temple, when we was in the wilderness, the Most High um, moved on Moses with the spirit of Moses to kind of have this set up, right? So when they're in there, this is how they would do it. They would have a uh, basically a big old tent, right, to cover everything. And then within the tent, I don't know if y'all can see the line, the white line. There, you see this uh, purple or this pink. This is a curtain. So like basically you go in the first curtain, you got your altar burnings, you, you know, your washing. And then you have this building, you're going to, we're going to go through it and you'll see it, but this is the Holy of Holies. You see what a curtain, and then you got this place, you know, called the Holy place. And you got the, you know, the menorah, but you'll see them candles that was in the temple. You got the shoe bread, right? And you got the incense where you had the altar at. And then there's another one, another little curtain. And then that place is the Holy of Holies. Okay, beloved. So there was, when you get in the curtain, you got this, this court. And then you got the holy place. This whole place is the holy place. Anybody cannot go in there. Only the priests can go in here. But then even this spot, even though the priests can get in here, this is the real VIP because not the priests couldn't just come in here. Only the high priest. 
and it wouldn't be just any time, but we'll get to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Leviticus chapter 16 and give me verse two. And the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. All right, so the mercy seat, beloved, is in this part, the holy of holies. This is the only, only person that should be going in here is the high priest. And he says what? He can't even go in there any time. Okay, so that's what that verse 2 is saying. That he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat. The mercy seat is here. All right, so some people get confused. It's not talking about this veil. It's talking about this veil. This one has the mercy seat. Okay, he can go in this one. They, they go in this one every day. This one, uh-uh. He said, you don't go in this at any time. Okay, he said what? That he die not. So it'll be deaf if you just go in there anytime. Okay. He said, I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So the most high would uh bring a cloud down at that time to kind of represent that he's dwelling there. Okay. Verse three. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So when he come in the holy place, he got to have a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. All right, so you got a bullock for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering, okay? We're not gonna go into all the offerings today. We're gonna kind of just stay on the point where we at, all right? So let's go to 16. We're still in 16. Let's jump down to verse six. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. So Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, right? Which mm -hmm. is for what? Himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Mm -hmm. You go to Hebrews, they make a reference to this. A lot of people don't understand the reference because they never studied the Old Testament or specifically this day. But he will have to actually atone for himself because the high priest had sins, right? So he said to atone for himself. Okay, let's keep reading. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So we got the sin offering, the bullock, the sin offering. Now we got what? Two goats, beloved. Okay, just like the picture I showed in the beginning. See them with two goats. Okay, you can present them before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this is outside the building, okay? So we got two uh, goats, read. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So we got one lot. So when you cast them lots, they would do that back in those days, kind of like, um, what would be something close to us? Maybe like rolling a dice and, you know, if it lands here, you do this land here, go there, that's how they'll kind of, they're kind of they're supposed to get kind of in a prayer mode and basically it's showing that God is choosing and not man. So they'll put it in something like that. So that's what he was casting lots. Um, so they cast a lot and it says one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So one, the Lord, basically this is how the Lord will choose it, which one he want for himself and which one he want for the scapegoat. Okay, beloved, one goat for the Lord, one goat, for, one goat is for the scapegoat. Okay, uh, verse nine. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So how, however the, the lots fall, okay, this is going to, the Lord chose this one, okay? And with this one, this is going to be for the what? Sin offering. So that's how they chose that. This one be for the sin offering, okay? Verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. All right, so you got one, one for the sin offering, but the other one is a scapegoat, which shall be presented alive before the Lord to make what? An atonement with him, okay? So one of the ghosts for the sin, one of the ghosts is gonna be for the atonement, 
And it says what? And let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. You will see after it, after they go through the uh um this process, they'll let it go in the wilderness. Okay. All right. So we got two goats, one for the sin offering, one scapegoat. Okay. Um, let's jump down to verse. Give me verse, what we at? 13, 14. Um, give me 14. Let me go to 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So he'll get the blood of the bullock, right? This is that bullock, what, in the beginning, right? Because when you're talking about the ghost, talking about the bullock. The bullock was for the sin offering for himself. This is the one he's going to sprinkle seven, seven times, okay? Seven representing that completeness. Um, and he's telling you exactly how you do it. Finger upon the mercy seat eastward, okay? And before the mercy shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times, all right? So that's talking about that place, okay? When you're talking about that mercy seat, that's behind that second veil, all right? Behind that second veil. Verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. All right. So I want us to realize it. When you get to Hebrew, now you can understand really what Hebrew's dealing with. He's saying he would sprinkle blood right from the bullock. Mm -hmm. The bullock is his atonement. Want us to understand it. He had to atone for himself first. Now he can take on the sin offering for what? For the rest. Okay. Did it did it say the rest already? Or am I going here? Yeah. Sin, yeah. Verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. Okay. The bullock was for him. This one is for the people. Because God's showing you that the priest. The, the leader, he got to be right mm -hmm. before he worry about cleaning somebody else. He got to be right. Because technically, if he ain't right, that ain't going to be right, what you're offering. So he's saying, like, no high priest, even though you supposed to be doing righteous, you still off. You need to atone for yourself. Now, when you atone and you clean, now I want you to go and what? Get the people right. Okay? That same kind of principle still applies. Oh, man. Right? Yeah. So go to the sin offering that is for the people and bring the blood within the veil and you're going to do exactly what you did for you. Uh -huh. Just like how you got right, you're going to do the same thing for the people and this is how they're going to get right. Yeah. Okay? All right, so let's keep going. Verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And shall... And shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. All right. Mm. So he's going to make atonement for the holy place. I want you to catch this. He's making atonement for the place now. Because why? Why did the place have to be clean? Because what? Because the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And because of their transgression and all their sins, mm -hmm. and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation. Right? You defiled the place. Yeah, it ain't about the building. But at the same time, you gathering and, and, and Lord looks like you defiled this building. You got to atone for the building now. I got to clean the building up because y'all 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 done made it a, a, basically like Christ was saying, a den of thieves. Y'all made it a, a sin palace. Okay, mm -hmm. read. We're gonna read, yeah, we can read, read right through 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And I said, everybody else be out. While the, while the high priest dealing with all this, everybody else be out. Let them let do this business. Okay. <laughs> it's so beautiful in dealing with Christ because Lord is it's, it's crazy. Verse 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it 
and shall take of the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Okay. Let's keep going. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon with his fingers seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. All right, so he's hollowing this thing. He's cleaning this thing up. Let me make sure I got some of the notes in here. All right, let's keep going. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So I wanted to get that because remember we talked about that reconciliation in the New Testament. <laughs> we see that word pops up early, don't we? Mm -hmm. When he had made an end of reconciling what? The holy place. Y'all done messed up my place that's supposed to be clean, supposed to be holy because of what y'all doing. Nothing was wrong with the place, but because y'all came and tamed up, now we got we to gotta clean up. I got to reconcile the place back because this is supposed to be a place that connects you to me. So he's reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle and the altar. Then he should what? He should bring the live goat. All right. Remember, we had two goats. Right. We had the bullock, which was for high priest. We had the one goat. Right. That was for the sins of the people, the sin offering the Lord chose. And then we still have what? Another goat. And this was supposed to be the scapegoat. Right. Hopefully y'all with me. If anybody ain't catching it, just unmute or whatever. Say, Mike, can you explain it? I want everybody to get it. All right. Verse 21. So what do you got to do with this live goat? And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So Aaron shall lay both of his hands. I want y'all to catch this. Both of his hands upon the live goat, right? This, this goat and confess over him, this confessing over the goat, all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all the transgressions and all their sins. Mm -hmm. It's a symbolism, beloved. Come. He's putting his hand on this goat and he's confessing the sins of Israel Come. and the transgressions. Mm -hmm. What's happening, if you can understand it, he is taking on the sins of the people and transitioning it to this animal. This is why you understand sometimes New Testament saying don't lay hands on people suddenly. Because what? <laughs> you grabbing spirits and all kinds of stuff. You're dealing with stuff you don't even understand. This is why you need to be right when you lay hands on somebody. Because that transferring can happen. This is why he's saying Aaron, I want you to do the bullock to get yourself, make sure you clean because you can't be doing this transition. You ain't clean. You might get something on you. So you got to be right. So he's going to put his hands on there. He's confessing all the transgressions and everything and shall send them away. Um, the fit man into the wilderness. And this is beloved. You see how the world gets scapegoat. This was us. <laughs> this is something they got from us because what this goal didn't do not wrong. Did it? Go didn't do nothing and is taking on what? The blame, the sin of others. Mm -hmm. It's like we talk, see, that, that person's a scapegoat. We done put all the blame on him and now he's going to take the punishment. That's what we basically doing. The most high set it up where, okay, you're going to have all this, the sin and everything. You're going to transition it to the leader, the priest, high priest, and he's going to transition that thing to the animal. Okay? And then that scapegoat, a fit man, I mean, a strong man, want to take that thing and take it to the wilderness and let it go. Okay? This is all relevance behind this. All right? Let's jump down to verse 29. And this shall be a statue forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. So you can't work, you can't be having other people work for you just like the Sabbath day, all right? Verse 30. For, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you 
that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. He didn't say you do it yourself. He said that who can make it for you? Read that again. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you. A priest. I, he said, I set the priest to do that. Because you have people, well, you don't got to go to them. You can just do it yourself. No, he said, I, this is how I set it up. I set up where you can put that thing on him and he can put it there. Did we read anybody else can put their hand on their goat and put the sins on the goat? He set up that the priest do it. He's able to bear all those sins and then put on that goat. You understand Christ? He's able to bear all those sins. Anybody couldn't just bear all the sins. Okay. Verse uh, 31. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. So we afflict our souls, the statue forever. All right. All right. Verse 34. Jump down to 34. And this shall be an everlasting statue unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So the Most High has a day dedicated to atone if you did anything wrong throughout that year you made it to atonement this was a day where you can get it all out all of it all of it away and be cleansed all right you set this day aside i'm not saying other days somebody couldn't get sins forgiven or anything i'm saying this is a day that was set aside just for this purpose okay uh, let's see the notes all right so some of the notes that we see there was a goat for a sin offering, and then there was a scapegoat um, that was alive for the atonement, all right? Um, the atonement is for Israel's transgressions and sins, um, and when they sent the scapegoat in the wilderness, high priests must make atonement to cleanse you. This is I'm making these notes because it's going to be important as we move forward, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think this might be the only slide I kind of showed the verse first corinthians chapter two and we're going to start at verse 11 first corinthians chapter two and verse 11 but what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of god knoweth no man but the spirit of god mm -hmm. so Basically, in other words, what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So carnal, the man can't understand sometimes spiritual things, can't grasp these things, not revealed to him. So you need the spirit of God to reveal spiritual things, okay? So some people, they look at it, that's stupid. what the heck are they doing? They're killing this animal, you know, that they're... they're, they're he, he, this guy's put both of his hands on the animal and, and confessing what people did wrong and letting it go. This is stupid. What the heck does God do with anything? Because what? The carnal mind, they don't understand. But us that have the spirit of God, we get the revelation. We get these things revealed to us. Okay? Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Mm -hmm. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Okay. And this is where it goes to. We receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. All right. So we get some things that God freely gives certain things to his people, to people that got his spirit. But you don't give it to everybody. All right. Read. Which things also we speak, not in the words of, of which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And this is what we do. We want to compare spiritual things with spiritual. Yep. We know this whole book is spiritual. Mm -hmm. And there's some things, even in that first covenant, that we can compare to this even second covenant. Or things in the Old Testament that we can make parallel to things in the New Testament, you know? They got these things. These are spiritual things. They're spiritual connections, all right? 
So we ain't going to teach it with man's wisdom. We're going to teach it as the Holy Spirit breaking down. We're going to break it down right through the word. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. All right. So the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So I don't, I don't like I said, I'm not going to get mad. Some people not going to get it. You can't get mad at that. All right. The natural man can't receive it, but the spiritual man, all right, he should be able to receive it. Natural man going to say, oh, that's foolishness. Oh, I hear what you're saying. That's just stupid. Mm -hmm. There's no point of this and that. That's, that's just stupid. Just that's what they're supposed to do. Okay. So no, no reason to get mad, beloved. That's how it is. But us, we're going to, we're going to dive a little spiritual with this. Okay. All right. Let's go to first John or I, John. I don't mess up Kai again. I John <laughs> chapter three. Let's go to I John chapter three. I John chapter three. All right, we know verse four talking about you know sin is a transgression of law. We got that. Let's read verse five though. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So in you. Ye know that he was manifested. That's right. We're gonna see who this this he is dealing with. All right, we should kind of know already, but he was manifested to take away our sins. That's right. And in him is no sin. All right, and in him is no sin. Let's go to Acts. I don't even know if I have it on the screen. Yeah, Acts chapter five and verse thirty-one. Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. All right. So this is dealing with, well, I don't want to even say it. Let, let, let's move up. I think above it, it says it. Hold on. Go to, uh, go to verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. So we see what? Father raised up Jesus and what? Who slew, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, right? Read verse 31 now. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness him, of sins. Him God exalted, him God chosen, okay? So he's exalted with his right hand to be a prince and to be a savior. I catch that. He got some titles. Exalt him to be a savior to do what? To save who? To give repentance to Israel, Israel. and forgiveness of sins. Yeah, that's funny. Because we read that what? The atonement. That was a time where Israel will say what? Confess all their sins and transgression and the high priest will put it on what? That scapegoat to be the atonement. Teach. All right. So we see that even with this, he was made to be a savior to do the same exact thing. Huh. People will be like, oh, it's so different. We in this news, you don't, you don't even understand what Christ's doing. All right. This is what he made him be. Because nobody could be a high priest. God chose him. He didn't say, well, I'm going to do uh -uh, God chose him. Okay. Oh, so when you look at that sin offering, the Lord lots fell or chose. So just going to Leviticus 16, I'm just showing you, this is where the Lord chose. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. All right. So make atonement for Israel transgressions. Let's go to Leviticus 17. Let's read this real quick. We're going to do some moving around, beloved, in the scriptures. Got to be like this because people want to argue every single thing. So we want to give some evidence for it. All right. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. 
For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for you for the soul. It's the what? The blood. blood. The blood makes the atonement. The blood is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the life of something. Okay, so when they were dealing with killing the bullocks and doing all those things, he was trying to show us a fundamental principle that the blood is the life. The blood makes the atonement. Mm -hmm. So when you see Christ doing certain things, you should understand why blood was very important. Why he said you got to uh, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. He, he's trying to show some things. Right? Mm -hmm. But we can go to all of it today. All right. <laughs> but Ephesians chapter one. Let's go to Ephesians chapter one. Right. Ephesians chapter one. Done told you the law is done away with, so you don't read it. That's why you don't have no understanding of what's going on. All right. Ephesians chapter one and verse seven. In whom we have redemption through his blood, mm. the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption through what? His grace. No, no, go back. His blood. Ah. Because mm -hmm. the what? The atonement, it, the blood is what makes the atonement. Yeah. The blood is what atones for our sins. That's how we get forgiveness. Because when you're dealing with atonement, it's atoning for what you have done wrong. That's forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So you can look at a day of atonement. You can look at it as a day of forgiveness. Redemption and forgiveness of sins through his blood. That was new to people. That's a big revelation to people that just read New Testament. But if you understood the prophets, because it's supposed to be our schoolmaster, if you went and did that, you will understand, yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it always been. Okay? He was preparing us for this. Okay? Even since the beginning. All right? Let's go to Isaiah. Chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Christ to have no choice but to be killed that way, for that blood to be shed. He just died and, you know, old man, no, nah, you got you got to be killed. The blood had to be shed because that's the atonement. The atonement was in the blood. Mm -hmm. right. So Isaiah chapter 53, right? Give me verse three. He is despised and rejected of men and men of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid it, it was our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And that's what he was. Yeah. We despised him. We rejected him. Man of grief. Mm -hmm. All right. Look at Oh, man. Look at the state of Israel. Now that's what he's doing. Look at the state of Israel. We hid our faces from him. We didn't want that truth. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We didn't honor him like a savior of us. We gave him the honor of an enemy. Somebody that's trying to destroy us. Let's keep going. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. And afflicted. And this is some of the burden we're going to have to deal with, beloved. It says, sure, he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was carrying the stuff that he didn't need to carry. He was carrying our problems, our situations. But what? We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That's how we viewed him. Everybody not going to understand what you do all the time. But you still got to do it anyway. Verse five. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Yes. He was bruised for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are he healed. You need to understand today. This is why it's important. He, because we don't think about this all, all the time, all year long. We don't come, we don't truly understand this. Mm -hmm. But he was wounded for you. He was bruised for you. And I'm saying you for us. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him. His stripes, we are healed. But beloved, when you think about it, it should have been you. It should have been you that was getting whipped. It should have been you that was getting spit on. It should have been you that was on that cross. We deserve that, not him. This is why we don't even understand the love that he had for us. In our actions, we show we don't appreciate the love of him. He didn't die for, as a guarantee that we was going to get right. He died that we have hope. He was dying for the ones that were saying, you ain't nobody, you a blasphemer. You're wicked, you're a sinner. He was dying for them. When we was in our sin, he thought about us. We was being wicked. He was thinking about us. This man did nothing wrong. He was going through it because he seen us through time. He said, my brothers and sisters are going to fall off. They're going to be wicked. They're going to need hope. They're going to need a chance. This is a humbling day, beloved. Because before we knew anything about the truth, he died for us. He paid that debt for us. We need to thank him. We need to really sit back and thank him. He showed us the perfection of love. He ain't do it for it, thank you. He ain't do it for none of that. He did it because he loved us. Let's keep going. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. All right. It pleased the Lord to do it. That's why the Lord chose him. It wasn't going to be anybody to say, oh, I'm going to do it. Mm -mm. He had to be chosen for this task. But our father said it, it pleased him to do this. Because he wanted us to be, he wanted, us, he wanted to reconcile us back to him. He loved us that much. Read. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. All right, he's going to justify many, right? Justify, make right. Many. Because he's going to what? Bear our iniquities. Mm -hmm. This is why we can come back to him. This is how we ran back. We, we getting back to this truth. If it wasn't for him, we'd be doing it in vain. He had to justify us. Finish it up. Therefore, while I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, but he had poured out his soul unto death, it was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what he did, right? He was numbered with the transgressors, right? There was it wasn't supposed to be righteous people on the cross, right? <laughs> but he was numbered with the transgressors as a sinner. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And that's what he did. He had to come down like us suffer, get beat, persecuted, do all this, shed the blood. And now, so what? That we can now, he can be that mediator, right? That intercession for the transgression. Now he's our mediator, okay? So we can get back to the father. All right, let's go to the high priest. Because it says the high priest makes the atonement to cleanse for you. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. And go down to verse 30. Leviticus 16 and verse 30. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you 
that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So the priest got to make an atonement for you to cleanse you. Okay. The priest got to do it. You want us to remember that the priest got to make the atonement for you. Couldn't do it for yourself. Let's go to John chapter 11. You know, people, well, Michael got you, right? Because Christ wasn't the high priest when he was alive. Mm -mm. That came after it. You, it says the high priest got to choose it. <laughs> no problem. John chapter 11. Let's go to, um, well, let me go, now go to 40. Uh, go, give me 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. All right, what are we gonna do? Right? They they come in and Christ is he getting believers. There's a lot of people that didn't believe in him, but there was people starting to believe in him. They like, listen, what are we gonna do with this guy? He's doing a lot of miracles, you know, and that gets people to start to believe in. Read. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. All right. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So they worrying about themselves. <laughs> They're like, man, if we don't get this under control, the Romans going, they're going to take everything. Okay. Read verse 49 slowly. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, mm -hmm. you know nothing at all. So who... We got priests and the council and all them Pharisees. They all together saying, what are we going to do? But who stood up now? The oh. high priest. He's saying, y'all don't know nothing. You know, you talk to them young people. Y'all don't know nothing. Y'all all worry. Y'all don't know nothing at all. Listen to what he says. Verse 50. Nor consider that it's ex expedient for us that one man shall die for the people. And that whole nation perish not. I want y'all to understand what the brother just said. It's better. It's expedient for us. It benefits us that one man should what? Die for what? The people. Yep. Where did he get that principle from? What, what, what revealed that to him? It's, it's better that one die for the people than what? The whole nation should perish. That makes sense. It's better that one person die than thousands of people die. But is the high priest saying this? Verse 51. And this he spake, and this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Come. So the high priest chose what? The atonement. He's saying this is better that this guy die than we all die. That's what atonement is. It's better that we put it, we put the sins on this animal than we keep all the sins and we all perish because we got sin. But who chose it? The high priest. He didn't even know the fullness of what he was doing. But what? He prophesied. That spirit, he the spirit was revealing it. Because what? He was going according to his word. God has patterns. He does things all planned out. He had them arguing for that sense. He made, he, he still went right to the high priest to have him say this because the high priest still had to choose the atonement. Read verse 52. And not for that nation only, uh -oh. but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. So he said, this is not just for them that's right here, the Jews, because Jews is just, mm -hmm. for the most part, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, right? He's saying, not just for them here, but for all the children of God. Mm -hmm. We know it's only one people that's children of God. For all of Israel, because what? The atonement is supposed to be for what? All the sins of Israel. He's supposed to be a savior. Didn't we read that in Acts 5? He's supposed to be a savior and for forgiveness for Israel. And he's prophesying that same thing. Yeah, that's right. the of it. 
Mm-hmm. All right. But we will already know this because we understand the scriptures. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's go back. Because Paul starts talking about, we ain't going to go into all of it. When we have our Friday to Saturday, we'll do something where we read the whole chapter. But we're just going to jump to different spots. All right. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 and 10. This I thought I knew what it was. But I had no idea until I understood the atonement. Now, now things got revealed with this. All right. All right. I got the uh, picture back up there for us as well. All right. Let's start from verse. Give me verse 1. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. I'm going to stop there for people. <laughs> the first covenant had also ordinance of carnal services. Divine. <laughs> that means, beloved, this thing is not no carnal. This ain't no thing from man. This thing was from the Most High God. If, it's not saying if you understand it, the service what they were doing was divine. Most High put it for a certain reason. But what? In a worldly sanctuary. I want y'all to catch it. Divine service in a worldly sanctuary. Because mm-hmm. the sanctuary is made by hand. That's worldly. The, but the service was divine. The service, the Most High looked at and said it was good because he put it in place. People try to throw everything out with it. No, it was a divine service if you understand the service. But of course, the outside, the worldly sanctuary, that's, you know, it's just what it is, you know. Read verse two. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. This is where we got here, right? Can you see the arrow? Um, Kai, when I'm moving around, you all see the arrow? Oh, yes. Okay. So I'm bring it down here. This is the holy place. It says, there was a tabernacle made. Okay. The first wearing the candlestick. I want y'all to see it. Candlestick, this area. The table and the shoe bread. This is where the, you know, the shoe bread is. And which is called the sanctuary. So this part was the sanctuary. See how he's naming the things? This is why you need to know the Old so you can understand it. He's naming this, okay? This is that um, the sanctuary they had. So he's saying this part was the sanctuary. Read verse three. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. This is the holiest of all, That's okay? Right. Or what we would call holy of holy. See, Paul knew the law. He knew these things, okay? So we got the tabernacle. We got this part, which is called the sanctuary. Then we got the holy of holies or known as the holiest of all okay what was in this read verse four which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold wherein was the gold pot that had manna and aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant all right so it had our commandments and everything and all that stuff in this part okay um read verse five and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. All right. Remember he said, I will come down in the cloud upon the mercy. This is where the atonement thing will come in. All right. Read verse six. Now, when these things was thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing, accomplishing the service of God. They, the priests, I want you to catch a blow because it's different. The priests went into what? This part, the sanctuary. Okay. Yeah accomplishing the service of God, but the service of God was a carnal? No, verse one said it was what? Divine service. Because it got some, it got some, uh, some, some deep spiritual stuff. If you understand the service. Okay. All right. So they will do this. They will do their thing in this one, right? With the shoe bread and lighting the lamps and the incense. So the priest would be in here doing that. Uh, verse seven. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Remember we read. Now we shall all know what Paul's talking about. The second went the priest alone. Remember he said only the priest can come in here, but he can't come here anytime. He only came in what? Once a year. Guess when that once a year is? Today, the day of atonement. 
but he wouldn't come there anytime with anything. He said, not without blood, meaning he couldn't go there unless he had blood with him, which he offered for himself. Remember, he had that the bullock to, to offer the sins of himself and for the errors of the people. Remember the other goat, sin offering, right? So he's, he's saying the same thing that we're talking about, but a lot of people have no idea because they didn't look at the Day of Atonement. This is that one time in a year. Verse 8. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holy of, of all was yet not made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Anybody know what that's talking about? Very specific. Uh, how is this saying? saying the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into holiness of all was yet not yet made manifest. How did the Holy Ghost show that? How did the Holy Ghost signify that? Uh -huh. So when you look at it, beloved, what did I tell you all these, these uh, pinkish or purple things were? What did I tell you these were? Anybody remember? What were these pink? things in this picture represent curtain the curtain good job sister Jill. right these are curtains so he's saying the holy ghost right this we can look the scriptures see you all they hear holy ghost they get all crazy with it the scriptures did signify that what the way into the holies of all was not yet made manifest it wasn't clear how to get there why a curtain blocks something when you don't want somebody to see something, you put a curtain up, you'll block it. So God was showing us through this that it wasn't clear how to get to the holiest of all. What came down in the holiest of all? Anybody remember what we read in Leviticus? What came down there, right? We got the mercy seat and everything. What came down on the mercy seat? Anybody paying attention? <laughs> Most high. The most high, how did he come down? What was the representation of it? Uh, the cloud. Remember he said, I come down the cloud, right? So it was manifest because what? Everybody couldn't go in there. So it was a block. It was a it was something to to not let us see that we can get there because he was doing something. No, y'all can't, y'all can't be presented to me here. Uh-uh. Y'all can't get to me yet. It ain't clear. It's still a mystery. The curtain shows that mystery. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, give me Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27. He was showing that you were not able to see into the holiest of all. Beloved, if y'all just want to get the mystery, think of the name, right? Holy of holies or holiest of all. Who is the holiest of all? Who is the holy of all holiness? Going to be the Father. And you want to see why it's very important. I say, if you know the laws, you can understand some a lot of deep spiritual things, but everybody can't receive it. All right. So Matthew 27, give me verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Mm hmm. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So the veil was rent, right? And you can see that symbolism that now I'm showing you that there's a way into something, okay? A veil protects something, it blocks something. But even when Christ, when Christ, when this happened, it says what? The veil of the temple rent in two. Because he's able to get somewhere that we wasn't able to get to. Okay, but we won't go into all that, but we're going to touch on it. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter eight. So when Christ died, the veil, the temple rent. All right, because he said that curtain was there, so we wouldn't know it was trying to hide something from us or prevent us from something, let me put it that way. Hebrews chapter 8, 
And we're going to get one verse out of there. Hebrews 8 and verse 5. Hebrews 8 and verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. All right. So Moses didn't wake up and say, you know what? I'm gonna make this, you know, this tabernacle thing. I think you should have this here. I think you should put this, this, this altar entrance in the curtain. I think you said, he said what? See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mountain. God showed him what to do. This is why it's divine service. He showed him how to set this thing up. And if you understand the setup, you can understand even the relationship of how God has it with us. Okay? So this was a divine setup. Okay? This was not Moses saying, I think this would be a good idea. Mm -mm. That's what people will have you do. No, no, no. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Stay right in Hebrews. Go to 9 and go to verse 22. Do some reading. 9 and verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Because we said what? The atonement's in the blood. All right? Read. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So we got blood to do atonement for the earthly tabernacle. Mm -hmm. But it's saying, beloved, it was necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these, right? We was purified through the blood of the bullock, right? In this earthly tabernacle. But what? It says, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, right? Because this tabernacle got man in it, right? It can only get but so clean or whatever. But he's saying that's a replica of the true tabernacle, which is above. That one need better sacrifice than y'all getting. Y'all sacrificing goats and all that stuff. This one is the actual true tabernacle. This requires a better sacrifice. Okay. So we're just showing you, this is the watered down version. What we got here is a watered down version. That's the real one. So it's going to need a better sacrifice. Okay. Read. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hold it. What you understand what it represents. Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands. This is the holy place made with hands. What they were making, what our forefathers were making, this is the one made with hands. Catch it. Which are the figures of the true, which is a replica of the true. It's a knockoff brand, okay, of the true tabernacle. Are we getting it? But it says, but he, he didn't enter into this tabernacle but he entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. See, he didn't go into this holy place, made by hands on said, uh-uh. He went to the true tabernacle and went to the holy of holies where what? The father dwells. Hope we catch in this, beloved. If you understood this, he was showing you a deeper thing. You needed blood. Remember, the high priest couldn't go without blood, you know what I mean, to get into where the presence of God was, right? That was a, a similitude. But he said, no, Christ actually went to where the Father was. He went to the true heaven, the true holy of holies, where the actual holy of holy is, okay? Verse 25, continuation. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. All right. So he don't need the often, right? Because every year 
they will do sacrifices every year, every year, every year, every year. All right. Verse 26. But then must he oft, often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Come. So he don't need to suffer since the foundation. He only needs to keep dying every year. All right. We're going to keep killing him every year. But what? But now once in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's so true. this is the time that the Most High chose for him to sacrifice himself, sacrifice for the sin, all right? So he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Read. And oh, as yeah. it pointed, keep going? Nah, we don't need that one. Okay. Let's keep moving. Let's go right to uh next chapter, chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers there on too perfect. And people don't understand what that's talking about, but we see what it's dealing with, right? The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, right? Because we're seeing some of these things. These are replicas. These is not the actual thing. The temple is not the actual temple of heaven or the... uh the sanctuary of heaven, right? It's a replica image, okay? The sacrifice we were doing, they're not the true sacrifice. Christ is, okay? So the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the thing, not the actual thing, can never with those sacrifices which they offer, listen to this, year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. They will come every year. Put their stuff on the high priest. The high priest will put on the animal. They'll do this every year. That couldn't make us perfect. That's what it's talking about. The Sabbath is not every year, right? He said, oh, see, it's talking about the seventh day Sabbath because you that could never make you perfect. This is not talking about that. It's very specific of what this is talking about, right? We read it from the beginning, <laughs> talking about it's over. That's what's happening every year because the sacrifices is what? It's supposed to be for us getting forgiveness, being atoned for our sins. When you're clean and washed away from all your sins, it's like you're perfect. But he's saying, listen, we was doing this service, but it truly didn't make you perfect. Right? Read verse two. For then would they have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. So he's saying, if it did make you perfect, if we thought that made you perfect, why would you need to do it year by year? Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. It, it, it never it never was designed to make you perfect forever. This is why you kept doing it. Okay, let's jump down to verse four. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And he's saying, that, get, show you another mystery. He's talking about the sacrifice of the bulls and the goats. He's saying that never was taken away sin. All them sacrifices of killing never take away sin. We're not going to go to it, but even David showed that. That's not the true forgiveness coming from killing the bulls and goats. Okay? But they had to do it in that dispensation. Read. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. He said, even in the law, it tells us, Mm -hmm. sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not but a body has thou prepared me you see how we know what to do already in the law the people just be making certain things well you don't have to do that because it's, he already told you that he's preparing a body for us that's why we knew it was going to be temporary see that, that's what they try to equate the sap and all these things to it no he already told us even in the law that this is only going to be for a time a season he said, don't worry, beloved, I'm preparing a body and that's going to be for you. All right. Reverse six. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin that has no pleasure. He was telling you, I never, I ain't crazy about the sacrifices and all that stuff you're doing with the, the bulls. I put it in place, but that wasn't the end game. That ain't what I want you to do here. And you know, forever just to keep killing bulls. What's that going to do? This is why he's saying, I had no pleasure in it, all right? Killing goats, y'all going around sinning the next year, and then you're killing some more. All y'all doing is killing all these goats and bullocks, all right? 
All right, verse seven. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. All right, so it's, um, I'm reading the uh, volume of the book. You know, it's dealing with me. This is what I say with Christ. He was already, it was shown his presence all through the scriptures. Okay, read. Above when he said, sacrifice an offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not. Neither had had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. So he's saying what? This was according to the law. Okay. You know, he's saying the pledges and all that stuff. This was according to the law. But we're going to keep going. Read. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take up away the first that he may establish the second. He can take this one away. That was always was supposed to be temporary. That's why he's showing you. He's already been giving you on the scriptures. I'm not, I, I never, I, I didn't require that, right? Saying, burn off, I, I never had pleasure in it. I never liked it, all right? It don't please me that you want to sin or doing all these sins in it, because this is what our forefathers were doing. We were sinning, and then we'll wait till it told and we want to give this, or we want to keep killing these animals instead of stopping the sin. That's why, like, I'm not, <laughs> that wasn't the point of that. It wasn't the point to, to just be playing the game of killing animals and saying, oh, I'm good with God. No. All right. So he's coming to, he's coming now to take away the first. That system of killing the bulls, and I'm taking that away. So you can establish the second. And the second is dealing with, you know who. Let's keep reading. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see how it's very specific and talking exactly what to do? Once. Take away the first to establish the second, by mm -hmm. the which will we are sanctified through the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So if he's coming and now we got this sacrifice that lasts forever, why would we need to keep doing the yearly, yearly one? No, he said, I'm coming to do this. Take away that. Okay. Think about our iPhones. We updating. Now you about to, you about to get you about to get perfected, right? I'm not talking about these iPhones we got, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. you get the upgrade. You don't still worry about, you know, the first one that came out, right? We got a perfect upgrade. It's so now you can throw away those old ones. You get the video games, right? And the PlayStation, they got four or five, you know, Xbox, same thing. You ain't playing the old ones. They what? They're done. We established this one to take away the first one. That's what he did with the sacrifices. I'm giving you this perfect one to throw away those ones. So we don't need to do the killing of the goats and I'm sure they rejoice. You don't need to do that stuff no more, okay? You don't need to be killing all them and definitely for sin. Mm -mm. We got the perfect sacrifice. Let's go down to verse uh, 18. Now where remission is the, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Mm -hmm. So there's no more offering for sin, read. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to look at it, but verse 18, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. When you have given it to Christ, and he's forgiving you for your sins, there's no, you don't have to worry about sacrificing them no more. Nope. It's a system that's done now because we have this system. You're going to get it all clean by God and then what, what? What do you have to give to the goat to kill if he's, if Christ is there to do that, okay? So um, what, what verse was that? 19. All right. So having therefore brethren, sister and boldness to enter into the holiest by what the blood of jesus now do y'all see that people don't really he's saying boldness to enter into the holy because what only the high priest can get to the holy of holies right through the blood right he had to come with the blood to get to the holy of holies but he's saying now you can go into the holies of holies spiritually beloved right by the blood of Jesus, by our atonement. That's how we get into that one. God was showing us that in the Old Testament. You can't see me unless you got the blood because you messed up. 
You need the blood to atone for you to get to me. But now it was showing us of the true to truly get to him. We need the blood of Christ. This is why you have to believe in him or you can't get to him. That's why I refer to as the way, because if you don't have the blood, you there's no way you get into the Holy of Holies. This is why you have to understand. This is why he's making the same analogies, beloved, of using the atonement and putting it where, putting Christ in it to let you understand he is that atonement. All about him. Save the goats. Save the bullocks. He's the true atonement. All right? All right. Give me this, this last one. Give me, give me Romans chapter 5. Or do I be a little long beloved? But we, we this, this is it. All right? Romans chapter 5. And give me verse, go down to verse 8. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> And give me verse, um, go to seven. Give me seven. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now listen, I might die for somebody that I feel is righteous, totally righteous. Peradventure, maybe if he's even a good person, I might die for him, right? So he's saying, we don't just, we don't just lay our, down our lives for anybody. For a righteous person, yeah. For somebody that's good, yeah, we, we might do it, right? But read verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, the praise Father God. loved us so much. He sent his son to die for us in that's a right. state where we were sinners. We mm -hmm. weren't even righteous. We weren't even good. He said, you were the most filthy thing and he died for you. As I said, we don't understand God's love. We have this fake, we don't understand the half of it. He ain't just come and die. It makes sense if he died for people that was trying to do right. Mm -hmm. If he died for the, the prophets of old, Isaiah, you know, the, the famous forefathers. No, 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 no. He was showing his love to us. When we was filthy in sin and wickedness, he had Christ die for you. This is your day. This ain't a sad occasion, beloved. Mm -mm. I'm not trying to make you sad. Put you in remembrance and rejoice for what Christ has done. Let's keep going on. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Being justified because the blood atones for us. That's right. Being now, because Christ's blood atoned for us, we shall be saved from wrath through him because there's wrath that got to come. But we're going to be saved through it because he atoned, his blood atoned for our sins, beloved. Verse 10. For if when we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Mm. When we were enemies, and we were enemies, when you was in that world, you, you was an enemy. Mm -hmm. I don't care how half-stepping you thought you was doing, you was an enemy. You just sinner, you were an enemy. We were what? Reconciled. There go that word, reconciled again, to mm -hmm. God. How? How do we get back to God? How do we get that relationship back with God? By the death of his son. Much more being reconciled we should be saved by his life. Not just connected with God, but we will actually be saved through the blood. Thank God. Thank God for his son. All right, let's go to his last part. Let's go to Zechariah chapter eight. We will end it here, beloved. Sometimes you got to hear. And it's the good thing about, you know, um, knowledge it ain't about a boasted thing but knowledge will have you appreciate things more right i mean we love we love christ you know we we, we thought we loved him i put it that you no know, we we loved him but when you just really realize what he's done it just put a it just it puts more weight like wow like he really really loved us you know so that's why it's good to understand it so you can really appreciate the love of god all right 
All right, Zechariah 8 and verse 18. Zechariah 8 and verse 18. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, mm -hmm. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Right. And beloved, <laughs> just for disclaimer, this is not talking about the Day of Atonement specifically, just so you know. This is why I say in fourth, fifth, these were times where the temple was getting desecrated and things of that nature, and they will fast. Fast was a sign of mourning, right? So they will they will fast because it was such a you know tragic thing that would happen. That's why our forefathers would do certain things. So they would they uh, made these days to fast, right, and commemorate you know the loss of certain things. But he's saying even those things is going to be eventually is going to be for joy and gladness and cheerful, right? Therefore, love the truth and peace. So even with this atonement, it's supposed to be affliction and everything, but I want us to understand that even when we fast and everything, this thing is a joyous occasion. It should be glad. It should be some cheerfulness. Why? Because he sent his son to forgive us for all our sins. What can make you happier than that? What can make you more glad than that? Joyful or cheerful than that? Don't we love the truth? Don't we love God, right? And like we say in the Hebrew tongue, Kyle, Lalia, how about Shimmy? I was shy. <laughs> All praise to the Most High in the name of His Son, right? With that, I will say, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom.